Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm honored to be here today. I'm, I'm grateful that you all came to listen to me talk. So I want to make you a promise right now, and that is I will not waste a minute of your time. Okay, that's my promise to you right now. Fair enough? All right. So I know that uh, just before lunch, uh, the heads might be a little disconnected, thinking about other things. I have uh, two exercises. Would you be willing to participate before I get into the material? Yes. Excellent. Oh, what a nice crowd. All right, the first exercise is really simple. I'd like all of you to please take out a blank piece of paper or open up your smartphones, your iPads, whatever it is. I want you to make a list. So for 60 seconds, just 60 seconds, I want you to make a list of everything that's on your mind right now. It has nothing to do with what we're going to talk about, just all the things you're thinking about. All the people you have to call, emails you have to send, pick up the cleaning. Ready? Go. 60 seconds. Three, two, one. Go ahead and quickly finish up that last item. And for those of you who wrote it on a piece of paper, fold that up and put it in a safe place. If you did it on your smartphones or an electronic device, go ahead and save it now. And now, you should have nothing on your mind. <laughs> right? How's that feel? Very good. Okay, good way to start. The next thing I'd like you to do, the second exercise I'd like you to go through, is kind of a life-changing event. So I want you to prepare yourself. Now, if you've seen this before, I ask that you think back to the first time you've seen it. I'm going to put some words up here right now. I'd like you to read them to yourself. And when you're done reading them, look back over here at me so I'll know we're all done. Okay? And if you've seen this before, I ask that think back to when you first saw this, and it has to be done in complete silence. Ready? Go ahead and read. Okay. All right. Everybody got it? We're not reading for context. Not for meaning, just read it. Okay, great. So now I'm going to ask you to do something very simple. I'm going to put those words back up here. By the way, how many of you have seen this before? I know one person has. Two? Oh, excellent. Three? Excellent. All right, I'm going to put the words back up here. And this time I want you to count all of these. All of the Fs, like in the word finished. Okay, now in finished there's an E. I'm not looking for partial letters. So I'm not looking for an F inside an E. Direct Fs right there in front of you. I'm not looking for black text on a black background or white text on a white background. When you have your answer of how many of these you see, please stand up. When we're all standing, I know we have it. Ready? Silence. Go. This is not hard, so somebody can stand up very quickly. There we go, thank you. You can double check yourself while we wait. I know some of you have already triple checked yourself. Okay, now watch what happens around the room. All of those of you who saw three or fewer F's, could you please sit down now? Now, we've all were looking at the same thing, weren't we? How about four? Could you please sit down now? Five? Could you please sit down? Six? Could you please sit? So there were six. Right there, right in front of you. Go ahead and find the others. Because we don't have a lot of time, I'm going to help you out. Here's one, here's two, and there's three. Right there in front of you. There was no trick, right? I didn't stand there in front of it and block it. The point to this exercise is very simply this. What I'm about to share with you right now about how to captivate any audience is not new. 
In fact, many of the things I'm going to tell you are right there. They're right in front of you, but you just don't see them. So hopefully when you leave here today, you'll have at least one more F than you walked in with. <laughs> and with that, let's get into the material. So to begin with, whenever you're presenting, people always ask me, what do I, how do I start? What do I say in those first 30 seconds? And my response to you always is, who's the audience? You've got to know who the audience is before you can actually design how you can captivate them in the first 30 seconds. But let's assume for today that you know who your audience is, whether it's one-on-one, one-on-many, -on -one, one -on makes no difference. And let's get into the actual material. So now I'm going to present. I look at presentations as having basically, well, I'm sorry, I forgot. I'm going to hand you today some tools, tools that hopefully you'll start using when you present. I'm going to share three tools with you here today, okay? And as we get into it, what I want to focus on is just the opening. Because the rest of it, most people are fine in the middle of their presentation, but the opening tends to be the weakest part of most people's presentations. The closing also, but I'm only going to talk about the opening here today. So let's begin. I see hundreds of people present, whether it's entrepreneurs or customer presentations, wherever they're presenting. And they all kind of look like this and like this. They all sound the same. They smell the same. They use the same words. They look the same. If they're in social networking, they're all saying the same things. But every once in a while, you see somebody that stands out. And this is what I'm going to give you some tools today so you can stand out. You don't have to stand on your head to stand out, but you will stand out if you start using some of the tools that I'm going to share with you today. And number one is this, how to stand out among a crowd. Romero Brito is a pop artist. He happens to be one of the most popular pop artists in the world today because he was willing to go big and go colorful and break the rules of art. So I want to tell you how never to be the same as anyone ever again. And all you need to do is remember this. S-A-M-E. That's what you need to remember. Just remember this word and you'll never sound the same as anyone ever again. But actually there's two S's here. Let's go through each one. Here's the number one way to captivate any audience in less than 30 seconds. You ready? Here it is. And you're going to say, I know you're going to say, oh, I already knew that. <laughs> Here it is. And it doesn't even take 30 seconds. The first S, story. You need to tell stories. And when you walk up in front of an audience and say, you know, before I begin today, I just want to share a short story that happened to me on the way here today. Oh, you'll never believe what happened on the flight when I was flying in yesterday. Do you want to hear the rest of that story? I'm just making it up. But the point is, when you start with a story, just like Steve Jobs went in front of the 2008 graduating class at Stanford, he walked up to the lectern and he said, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, I have three stories to share with you here today. And everybody got their paper out and they wrote down one, two, three, because they were ready for three stories. So story. If you're looking for help on how to tell stories, one of the most effective books that I've read was written by Craig Wortman. He and I presented at the Kauffman Foundation last year, and I thought he was an excellent speaker. His book, called What's Your Story, really breaks it down for you. It breaks it down into success stories, failure stories, customer stories, prospect stories, personal stories, back stories, logo stories, feature function stories, all these different stories that you can use when you're talking to people that make it a lot more interesting than if you just talk fact, 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 or feature, feature, feature. The best part of stories is they're repeated. So when you tell someone a story, if it's a good one, they might repeat it. When you're presenting to angel or venture capitalists and you're doing a one-on-one -on -one presentation with them, guess what? They have to go back and talk to their team and their partners. Are they going to repeat your facts? Maybe, but they might repeat your story. Okay, so that's the first S. Now let's jump to the E. The E is a place where most people go when they want to talk about what they're doing. They use examples. And examples are great, but in a large room, if you choose one example, like a director's chair as an example, and you describe what a director's chair is like, some people in the room might be thinking about a club chair or a rocking chair. So you might confuse your audience a little bit. 
So examples, while good, I believe tend to be not as effective as a story or the other three things I'm going to share with you right now. So examples of what the E stands for. The next I want to share with you is a story. So at the IBM Smart, fi Smart Camp Finals last year, there were 12 presenters, 11 presenters that went up to present. And the seventh one went up and he said, ladies and gentlemen, I'm so excited to be here today because I want to share with you our machine that turns water into money. <laughs> and that's how the 400 people in the room reacted. And he actually does make a machine that turns water into money and this is it. It's about so big, turbines on the outside edges, flappers in the middle, you throw it into a waterway, the flappers start turning, you plug it into the grid and now you have free electricity. So does he turn water into money? No, of course not. Not literally, but he's using the famous metaphor. Metaphors are so powerful in business, but we don't tend to use them enough. So the M in same stands for metaphors. And metaphors, just in case you need to remind yourself of the formula, because it's been a while, it's just when you say A is B, or A are B. The trees are the lungs of the earth. It's a metaphor. They're not literally, well, in some cases, some people say, actually, yes, they are literally. Okay, so that's what the M stands for. Okay, the next is another story. So I always love to ask people what they do. And in a workshop about eight months ago, I said, so what do you do? And the gentleman said to me, Nathan, I'm the CEO of Maverick Surfboards. We do for surfers what the chairlift does for snow skiers. I thought, okay, you got my interest. Interesting. And they said, you know, the problem with getting with skiing is getting to the top of the mountain and the chairlift fixed that problem. Well, the problem with surfing is getting out to the waves and we have fixed that problem by producing an electric surfboard. There's a wireless controller that goes on your thumb and you press the button and it engages the little motor so you can motor out to the wave you want to surf. That's a professional surfer. Here he's motoring out to the wave. And here he's motoring in front of the wave so he doesn't get crashed on top of the wave. You might say, well, why do you need an electric surfboard? Well, if you have more fun doing the sport you love to do, why not make it electric? Of course, no, you don't have to plug it in and take the cord out and you get that. So the point here is he could have said to me, Nathan, we make electric surfboards, which is what most people tend to try to do. In one sentence, they try to tell people what they do. And often it gets lost. You make electric surfboards, that's not a big wow to me. It's like, why would anybody need one of those? But the way he presented it, using an analogy. And that's what the A stands for. Analogy. And the formula, A is to B as B is to C. I'm sorry, C is to D. Simple as that. So you need to use more metaphors and analogies. And the last one, the other S, is when you say things like, I slept like a baby. Or sleeping at that hotel last night, the bed was like sleeping on a bed of feathers. So it's the old simile where you just use a is like B, or just as with this. Okay, so we don't have to go back to grammar school, but similes, analogies, and metaphors are what you need to use more when you're presenting. They will be lasting in the minds of your audiences. When you go back and take a look at this presentation, which you'll have a link to at the end, I have a list of just some similes, analogies, and metaphors. I collect them. Because often with my clients, I have to sit down and get creative with you and figure out, okay, well, how do we come up with an analogy for your business? Well, I'm not a creative savant. I need input. So I just collect them. And then when I need help, I just go look at the list. You can do the same thing as well. Just start collecting them. But the most important thing I want to tell you about similes, analogies, and metaphors is this. They are culturally sensitive. All right? So if I was in Ireland right now and I said, you know... That's like chalk and cheese. How many of you know what that means? <laughs> One or two, three, four of you might know what that means. 
So if I said that here, assuming all of you know what that means, that might just fall flat. But if I said, you know, it's like oil and water. They don't mix. That's one of the meanings of chalk and cheese. And just lastly, on similes, analyses, and metaphors, in terms of how powerful they are. You know this guy? Professor Stephen Hawking? So he came to California, and my wife and daughter went to see him present at a conference. I thought, well, I don't need to know about that stuff. They came back and they said, Dad, you would never believe it. You should have been there. I said, why? He said, because every time Stephen Hawking spun our minds with scientific terms and whatnot we couldn't understand, he'd stop and say, oh, wait a minute. That, what I've just described to you is like taking a heavy ball and dropping it on a rubber mat. And when it does this and does this, that's like air, um, uh, light bending through a wormhole. So he used similes, analogies, and metaphors constantly throughout the talk, or nobody would understand a thing, well, a few of us, would understand a thing of what that man talks about. That's how powerful they are. Okay, so now I don't like to talk about what unless I give you a how. So how do you come up with your own? One, you could go hire a PR firm for a lot of money, and they'll help you come up with these. Or use your own brains and the people you work with. You can go to places like Getty Images or Jupiter Images, some of these really great photography websites out there, and do something like this. So let's say you're looking for a metaphor in security. You put in the word security and take a look at the pictures. You need to help the right side of your brain get more involved in the creative process. Now, there are over 500 pages that came up when I put the word security in there. So don't start on pages one. Jump to the last page and work backwards. Because the last page is going to have uh, photos that are tagged a little bit weirdly, which is kind of what you want. You want the right side of your brain to start going, well, what does that have to do with security? Like, what does a, oh yes, a bank vault, security. Or maybe the yellow tape could have something to do and that metaphorically represents this in our business. Or better yet here, now we have this and this, and then your brain starts going, oh yeah, mm. okay. So that's one way to help your brain come up with similes, analogies, and metaphors. The second way is a very famous website out there called Reader's Digest. It comes in 68 different languages, I believe. So you should be able to go there and find stories, all sorts of things like taglines, titles of different publications that can help you with your creativity. So you start looking at the titles of their articles and you start to think, well, maybe I could use that title and switch this word to that word or it triggers an idea. So readersdigest.com, rd.com, great resource and I believe most of what you can get there is free. And then the last tool to give you for is movie critics. Movie critics come up with great things like things that go bump in the attic or just look at the, how they describe their movies. Uh, the Mysteries Upon Mysteries of Lisbon. Well, maybe you're not dealing with Lisbon, but you kind of like that, The Mysteries Upon Mysteries. So you can take that line and maybe change the words so it meets more with what you're trying to do. And uh, there's tons of movie critic websites out there. Now, all of this leads to a paper that was published a few years ago by this gentleman who's sitting in the audience here today, Bill Reichert who you'll be hearing from later on today. Now, Bill didn't know I was going to do this today, so Bill, I apologize. <laughs> but years ago, when I read this article that Bill wrote, I started to coach my clients on it. And the article is, Getting to the Wow, which is, what can you say to someone in one, two, or three sentences that they say, wow, how do you do that? Or, wow, tell me some more, I want to know more. Most entrepreneurs, they study their two-minute pitch or their elevator pitch and they get it ready and somebody says, so what do you do? And I don't think you have permission to go into your elevator pitch at that moment. I think it's more important that you get them to say, wow. Or, hmm, that's cool, I'd like to hear more. So I encourage you to go take a look at this article. And here's Garage Ventures, wow. They say, we start up startups. That kind of encapsulates it for you, doesn't it? And then you'll say, hopefully, wow, how do they do that? And every one of you need to have some sort of a wow. I have a friend from Sydney. He walks up to people and he says, hi, I'm Sydney from Sydney. <laughs> That's really his name. And he's really from Sydney. That's his wow statement. People go, wow, that's so cool. So it doesn't have to be technology related or business related. It can be anything that gets somebody to say, wow. All right? That's tool number one. 
what's your wow? Now, normally in, a, in, a, in an environment where we had a workshop, I'd break you all into groups right now, and we'd come up with some wow statements that you all can use in your future. I leave that to you to do as homework. Tool number two. If you walk into any audience, whether they're an audience of one or many, if you assume that they all look like he looks, you'll be in much better shape to present any information that you have to present. What does he look like right now? Bored, tired. To me, he encapsulates, that look encapsulates preoccupied. He's preoccupied with something else on his mind. So what I'm going to share with you now is a 40-year-old uh, secret. When I was uh, 15 years old, I found a book in my basement. And the book was called The Magic Power of Emotional Appeal. And I have it right here, so you know it's, this is really a true story. It was written in 1960. And you think, what could a book written in 1960 have to do with today? But I'm going to summarize what this book did for me when I was 15 that I've used over and over and over with just about every audience and every communication I've used throughout my career. And I'm going to give it to you all right now in about five minutes. The book's out of print. Sorry. <laughs> all right. So what Roy Garn did is he summarized the fact that he got me to think, everyone you talk to is preoccupied. So you need to do something to break through the preoccupation. And you shouldn't leave it to luck. Now some of you do it very naturally, but I'm going to break it down a little bit into the science behind how to get through the preoccupation that we all have when given a presenter. All right, here it is. This is the number two tool. It's called the fatal four. The fatal four emotional appeals. And he calls it the fatal four because there's no defense. Your audience cannot stop you from using these things. There's just no defense against them. That's why he calls them the fatal four. Let's go through them. And again, you're going to say, oh, yeah, of course I knew that. Number one, the number one preoccupation breaker is to talk about money. <laughs> how to make it, how to save it, how to spend it, anything to do about money. You'll break through the preoccupation that people have in their minds. Okay. Number two, self-preservation, security, safety. So if you have a product that will secure your data, protect it from others getting access to it, you're pressing on this emotional appeal. If you have a product that will, say, that will keep my family safe, if we were in California right now, I'd start getting to think about earthquakes. And I'd ask you, how many of you are prepared for an earthquake right now with food and water for three days in your car? And maybe one or two hands would go up. And we're in California. So when you start talking about things that re rely on, revolve around self-preservation, security, or safety, boom, you'll get their attention. Next, recognition. Whenever you give recognition or get recognition, that breaks the preoccupation. I did that with all of you to start with, didn't I? It was the first thing I said to all of you. The simplest way to recognize, give recognition, thank you. I thanked all of you. Thank you for being here three or four times. So I use this emotional appeal just to get you break through that preoccupation a little bit. How many did that work for? Okay, most of you. Good. And number four, you're going to get this one. You're going to say, oh, yeah, of course. Number four is sex. <laughs> sex breaks through the preoccupation no matter what your sexual preferences are in the world. But we're not here to talk about sex unless you're doing a pornographic website, and then we're not here to talk about that. So thinking about how to break through this preoccupation, you have romance or future promise or a new experience. So when you talk about the future and what you'll be able to do with this and how your life will be so much better and how much more you'll get out of this, all of these types of statements are talking about the future. These are the four Fatal four emotional appeals, and you can use one or more of these in your presentations. And not just in the first 30 seconds, but what about seven minutes later when you start to see the audience is not quite with you? Use another one. And five minutes later, use another one. Ten minutes later, use another one. So intertwine them throughout to make sure you keep breaking through the preoccupation, because you can't guarantee that people will stay with you for the entire time. So it's your job as the presenter to check in once in a while with their heads. Okay? So that's number two. 
Number three is a study that came from Dr. Albert Morabian at UCLA back in 1972. So when I was in mainframe computer graphics in the early 80s, I was quoting this study about how much more effective visuals are to communicating data than spreadsheets were. And I researched and we were all quoting this study from Dr. Albert Morabian and some of you may have heard of it, but I like to go back to the source. So I picked up the phone and I actually dialed the phone, 1981 when we still had dial phones, called him up and I talked to him on the phone. And what was so exciting about this study was that he showed me how people receive the messages that we impart. So when you're talking to a group, how do you know what people are hearing? It's not about what you say. It's about what they hear. Okay. So he put this study together to break down communication. What happens when people actually communicate? And he broke it down into three parts. The words that you use, how you use your voice, and how you use your face. And today we call it body language over on the face side of things. But how many, uh, if you take a look at the pie of 100%, what percentage of the message people hear from you comes from the words that you use? 15? A little high. Five is a little low. It turns out to be seven. Seven percent of the message people get from you come from your words. Okay. How about your voice? 38. And you could do the math. 55%. More than half the message you're communicating to your audiences is coming from your face. How many of you have rehearsed your face? <laughs> Not many of you, right? So it's really important that you start to get a sense for what's happening up here. Because if you're not paying any attention to what's happening right here, your audience is. Your audience is. And if you're saying something and your face is not matching what you're saying, guess what they believe? Your face. Your face, your face typically doesn't lie. So be very cognizant of the fact that 80 I'm sorry, 93% of communication is what's happening with your voice, how you use your voice, the tone of your voice, the speed, the volume, and other things that you can play with on your voice, how you emphasize words, not just standing there, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very excited to be here today. And I have uh, three tools that I would like to get everybody really excited about today. That's just a way to put people to sleep. So keep this in mind. If you want to read about this study, he has a book out called nonverbal communication. And while I'm not a big believer in all the nonverbal communication of what you see when you're looking at people, as far as how you are perceived by people, I would take a close look at what you're doing when you're in front of people. Get yourself on video and watch. You want to know what message you're giving out when you present? The best way to do it, get about a three minute video clip of yourself, turn off the sound, and then ask a hundred people to watch it and say to you, what message did you get from me? What message did, I, did you get by watching me present? Remember, there's no sound, so they only have your face to look at. And you'd be amazed at what people will tell you. I love to get before video of my clients and get people to say what they get from them and then get after video of them. It's like night and day, because you realize your face is a big part of what you're communicating to people. You actually have more muscles in your face than most other parts of your body. So use them. Have fun with them. And if you're having fun, you should let your face know it too. <laughs> All right, to wrap this up, I want to show you the power of storytelling and what it can do to move people to take action. And the story comes from two women that I met at the Kauffman Foundation last year who were at Columbia University and during the Haiti earthquake, the project that they were given in their master's class was to come up with something to help the victims of the earthquake. So these two women came up with this product called Luminade. And I'm just going to let you watch the video so you can hear the story from them. Hi, I'm Anna. And I'm Andrea. We're working on a project to make and distribute a very simple solar lighting product that we designed for disaster relief aid. 
So 1.6 billion people in the world, roughly one in four, lack access to a stable source of electricity and light. More recently, disasters in areas such as Japan, Haiti, and Pakistan have left millions more without electricity. Many of these people are forced to rely upon dangerous, toxic, and expensive kerosene lanterns as their primary source of light. In the wake of the Haiti earthquake, Anna and I came to know more about the dangerous and unsafe conditions in the tent cities at night, especially for women and children. Light is a very basic need, and we believe that in addition to food, water, and shelter, that light should be distributed with other relief supplies. Portable, rechargeable lights could have greatly improved living conditions for those living in informal settlements, but there wasn't a product that was designed with this scale of distribution in mind. Most were too expensive and too bulky to distribute in large quantities. Right, so we designed our light to directly address these challenges. The Luminate Solar Light is a solar rechargeable light that is inspired by a few very simple ideas. So for example, for every eight solar flashlights, you can pack and ship over 50 Luminate lights. This saves on shipping and transport emissions. It is also simple and easy to use. You charge it in the sun for four to six hours, and the solar panel charges a rechargeable battery that is connected to super bright LEDs. You inflate the Luminate light to diffuse the light like a lantern and reduce the glare of the bright LEDs. You can turn it on to the high setting to read for up to three hours or the low setting for up to six. The Luminate light is designed to be waterproof, to float, and to be extremely portable and lightweight. It can also be printed with patterns and logos. We wanted to make a product that was useful in many different contexts and situations. So, the same light that you can use for camping can also be an emergency light in a disaster situation. We've evolved and prototyped the design to reduce the cost, make it brighter, more durable, and easier to use. We hope you'll take a light on your next adventure or trip. Find creative ways to use the Luminate and share the stories and pictures with us. Staying true to the inspiration for the design, we'll send matching lights to our community projects with the lights that we make and produce for you. So we really appreciate you taking the time to learn more about the Luminate light. We're excited to share these lights with you as well as with those in need. And with your support, we're really excited to get this off the ground. Thanks. Thank you. So this is it. It's a rechargeable, portable, inflatable lantern. You literally blow it up. And you turn it on. That's it. And to know, little know about their success, they, were, they went on to Indiegogo. They were looking for $10,000. They raised 51.8 through crowdsourcing. <coughs> so the reason I like to show this story is because that video that they created was done for free. They didn't go to some professional to videotape it. Most of it was just pictures, zooming in and out, using what they call the Ken Burns effect. But wasn't the story compelling? It was a story. It wasn't, hey, we made this inflatable thing that you can press, turn it on. It's got two different light intensities. It's made of plastic and this, that. And it didn't, they didn't go into all of that. It made it into what it is. It's a story. And all of you can do the same thing with whatever it is that you're doing, whether it's a product, a service, or a cause. Okay? And that's it, folks. I wanted to thank you so much for your time today. I hope you've seen at least one more F than you came in here with today. And I want to thank you very much for your time today, and I'll be able to take questions uh, after if you'd like. So thank you so much.